All right. Looks like we're live. Hello. Happy Monday, everyone. Happy Marine Mammal Monday and happy June. I can't believe we're already halfway through this year. That felt like it just flew by. Um, so welcome to Marine Mammal Monday. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes here, um, but wanted to just kick us off and ask where everyone is tuning in from today. So feel free as we're waiting for people to join uh, to put in the comments here where you're tuning in from. Always love to hear where everybody's at. I'm coming at you today from San Francisco. We have a, a beautiful blue sky, sunny day today, although kind of windy. And where are you tuning in from, Diane? I'm tuning in from Redwood City. It's a beautiful day, but also very been very windy. Yeah, for you guys too. Oh my goodness. Wow. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for hopping on. We're going to get started in a second, celebrating Marine Mammal Monday. So you're in the right place if you are looking for Marine Mammal Monday. And this Monday, we're going to be talking about marine mammals of the world, it, kind of in celebration in conjunction with World Ocean Day, which just so happens to be tomorrow. So we are right on theme. So so happy to see the numbers climbing and people joining. Feel free in the comments to let me know where you're tuning in from today. I see we have Jennifer from Merritt Island in Florida. Welcome. Christian in Hayward, California. We've got folks from San Francisco where I am as well. Oh, Sri Lanka. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you for tuning in. Cool. Continue to let us know where you're tuning in from today. And while we're waiting for our numbers to go up a little bit here, also feel free to check out our website, marinemammalcenter.org. We have all of the previous recordings of other Marine Mammal Mondays, as well as lots of activity guides and a lot of online learning resources in general. So if you're looking for more, feel free to check out our website at marinemammalcenter.org. In the meantime, feel free to continue letting us know where you're tuning in from today into the comments. Would also be curious to know if this is your first Marine Mammal Monday or if you've been to Marine Mammal Mondays before. Would love to know. We've got, let's see, Diane from San Simeon, California. Hi, Diane. <laughs> another That's Diane. Good to see another one. <laughs> <laughs> we have Leah from Los Angeles. Welcome. Amber also from LA. Hello. <laughs> Very cool. We have folks from all over the world today for marine mammals of the world. How perfect. So if this is your first time joining Marine Mammal Monday, we're going to be diving in today talking about marine mammals of the world in just a moment here. Uh, but in the meantime, while we're waiting for people to join, feel free to let me know where you're tuning in from in the comments. Uh, if you've seen Marine Mammal Monday before, would love to know if you're returning and watching us again or if this is your first time. And we'll get started in a moment here. Hi, Harmony from Alameda, who loves our programs. Thank you so much, Harmony. <laughs> that always makes me feel so good to hear. All right, so we're just at four o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and hop in. We, uh, Like I mentioned, we are going to be talking about marine mammals of the world, but we always like to kick off our Marine Mammal Mondays with a little introduction of ourselves and of the center. So hello there. My name is Laura Gill. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for the center. So I have the pleasure of overseeing our programs across our range, including outreach and events and fairs and programs like Marine Mammal Monday. And I'm joined today by Diane. Would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you, Laura. I'm Diane Hardy. I'm the Education Volunteer Coordinator at the Center, and I have the pleasure to work closely with Laura. We're on the same team, Community Engagement, and I onboard and train our education volunteers and conservation education interns. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for joining today, Diane. Always so happy to present with you. And we also have the wonderful Katie managing our comment box. So feel free throughout the presentation to put any questions or comments into that comment section. And if we don't get to it in the live, then we'll absolutely get to it in the comments after. All right, so to kick us off, we are the Marine Mammal Center, which actually is the world's largest marine mammal hospital and education facility. So we are basically rescuing, rehabilitating, research, researching, and releasing any sick or injured marine mammals along California coast as far south as San Luis Obispo County and as far north as Mendocino County. And we even have a hospital out in Hawaii on the big island in Kona called Kei Kaiola, where, where we're caring for the endangered Hawaiian monk seal. So we have quite a big range and we're supported primarily by our wonderful volunteers. We've got close to 14 1,400 volunteers, um, which are vital to us as a nonprofit, and close to about 100 staff members like Diane and myself. And every single patient that comes through our doors here kind of starts the same way. It starts with a phone call from the public. So we have a 24-hour hotline that you can call and report sick and injured marine mammals along the coast. Once we get those phone calls, we will then get our volunteers together, our trained volunteers to go out and do a rescue. So in the top left-hand corner here, you're seeing a picture of some of those volunteers with their tools, like those wooden shields for protection. They might use things like a net to help capture, to rescue that marine mammal. And then we'll do things like use a crate or a carrier to put them on the back of our big rescue trucks and drive them to our hospital. Once they're on site, then we have our awesome team of veterinarians and volunteers that help to diagnose that patient. And we can basically do anything that you could do for a person for marine mammals. So in this top right hand picture, you're seeing some of our veterinarians do an ultrasound on a sea otter. But we can do things like surgery, stitches, we can do essentially anything that you'd get done at a human hospital for a marine mammal. And along the way, we also want to better understand what is the, the root cause of some of the issues of these marine mammals and how can we innovate marine mammal medicine. So we do a lot of research and we've discovered things like cancer and different diseases in sea lions and marine mammals that were then able to help advance medicine and understand better. And this could also have implications for human health as well. And then the ultimate goal, of course, is release. We want to get these marine mammals healthy and return them back to their ocean home. So in the bottom right corner, you're seeing some plump harbor seals that were successfully rehabilitated and are being released back to the ocean. Now, what Diane and I spend most of our time doing is the education side of our mission. So we are helping to raise awareness, share the stories of our patients, and hopefully emp empower you, inspire you to take action to protect these marine mammals. So I had mentioned at the very beginning, if you haven't had a chance to check out our website, marinemammalcenter.org, and you can see a variety of our online learning programs, uh, which we are continuing since the, the physical doors to the center were still closed, but we're still operating as an essential hospital. And we've got lots of virtual opportunities like Marine Mammal Monday. So since we are still a, a hospital and rescuing marine mammals along the coast, we actually do have about 74 patients on site in our care right now, including a few seven California sea lions. The majority is going to be the northern elephant seal, which we'll get to talk about a little bit more today. Then we've got some harbor seals, about 18, a northern fur seal, and six Guadalupe fur seals. So we've got five different species at our facility that we can talk more about some of these different species that we might see not only here where we care for them at the Marine Mammal Center, but around the world as well. 
So I mentioned that because it, we are going to be talking about marine mammals of the world. So we're going to talk about some of the species closer to home that we care for at the center, as well as some that we don't normally get to talk about or highlight. So we'll talk about some unique species. And again, this is all kind of in celebration with World Ocean Day, which is happening tomorrow. And really World Ocean Day is just a day to come together and take collective action to protect the ocean. So we thought it would be great to talk about some of the marine mammals of the world and what we might do to protect them. Yes, so thank you, Laura. And this year's theme for World Ocean Day is life and livelihood on our planet. And so we want to take a moment and talk a little bit about the importance of biodiversity. So biodiversity is the number and variety of plants, animals, and all organisms on Earth and our oceans. And how important um, this is to having a healthy planet, healthy ecosystems around the world. Every single organism from the smallest ones like krill to the largest like blue whales plays such an integral role in supporting life on earth. And the more species and organisms there are, the more resilient the ecosystem. Biodiversity is often used as a measure of how healthy an environment is um, because it helps build resilience to changes like climate change or or other threats um, that you know the the earth is facing and ultimately helps create a sustainable environment um, and sustainable livelihoods so um, not just animals but humans thrive in a more biodiverse planet now unfortunately the science shows that biodiversity is deteriorating around the globe. Uh, we're seeing a lot of species disappearing at a faster rate than they have at any other point in human history. And two of the main threats to biodiversity are habitat loss and overexploitation. So think of things like deforestation in the Amazon. That's an example of habitat loss. And that's mainly a problem that we see on land. And then overexploitation, you can think of things like overfishing um, that are mainly affecting our oceans from the bottom to the top of the food chain. Um, now, the exciting thing though, is that this has come to the world's attention, especially in recent years. Um, the United States President Joe Biden has recently sound, um, signed set a goal of conserving 30% of America's land and waters by 2030. And there's also um, this campaign called 30 by 30 to, um, to do just that. So establishing not only more national parks on land, but also establishing more marine protected areas, which are just like national parks, uh, except they are in the water. And, um, and which would be huge because that's a, a great way of conserving species in the ocean. And we'll talk a little bit about that through the presentation. Um, the 30 by 30 campaign would also involve a lot of community-based conservation on privately owned and indigenous owned land, which are incredibly important and have contributed a lot to some of our most uh, protected and well-preserved places around the globe. Um, and protecting, establishing these areas would protect um, not just these, the, the biodiversity of species on earth, would also protect people and benefit us um, in our world. And the Marine Mammal Center, as an organization, we have signed on in support of the 30 by 30 campaign, um, but our especially is mostly in protecting marine mammals. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the diversity of marine mammals we've seen, we'll see um, around the globe, as Laura mentioned. So let us know in the comments if you can identify all five groups of marine mammals. Um, you can name some species too if you can't think of the name of the group, um, but there are five main groups of marine mammals. So write them down in the comments if you can come up with them. And while people are guessing, Diane, and this might help people guess too, what are some of your favorite marine mammals? 
Oh, such a good question, Laura. Um, let's see. I really like uh, at the center some of our species that we have on site right now. I really like the fur seals. Um, I also really like orcas. Ooh. What about you, Laura? Those are good. The, it's hard to narrow down. There are so many that I also love. Um, but probably out of the animals that we see at the Marine Mammal Center, my favorite would be the California sea lion. I just think they're so amazing. They're so intelligent. Um, and also, I'll just do a shameless plug that we're going to have two Marine Mammal Mondays this month. Um, and next month, we're highlighting all about California sea lions and actually their collective birthday because over half of them are born on June 15th. So join us next week to learn more about that. And we'll take a look here to see how many guesses have come in. <laughs> I've seen some answers here. Um, so I see Katie Russell saying cetaceans and Azul saying seals, otters, whales, dolphin. Uh, Nelumika is saying pinnipeds, cetaceans, and serenians. So you've already named a few. So let's maybe start revealing some of the answers, Laura. So a few of you have mentioned seals and sea lions and said the word pinniped. So pinniped means flipper footed and includes the seals, sea lions, and also walruses. And in our second group, I see a few people uh, named cetaceans, uh, which include the dolphins, whales, and porpoises. And then in third, I don't think I saw anyone enter this, but that's a little bit more of a tricky one. Polar bears are indeed marine mammals because they do spend most of their time on sea ice. They also depend on the ocean as their main source of food. So they are considered marine mammals and are actually pretty closely related to pinnipeds. And then in our fourth group, we have the smallest and furriest of marine mammals, the sea otters, very popular along the West Coast. And then finally, we have the serenians, which involve the, include the dugongs and the manatees. So thanks everyone for participating. Um, a little bit of a tough one. There are a lot of marine mammals out there and we'll talk about some of these different groups throughout the presentation. But first I'm gonna pass it over to Laura who's gonna talk a little bit about um, a certain pinniped. Thank you. Yes, so it would take um, several presentations, I think, to talk about all five of these groups. So we're going to try and touch on, we'll touch on at least three of these groups today. Uh, but first, we'll focus on the pinnipeds, like Diane was saying. And we've got about 33 species of pinnipeds around the world. So you can take a look at this little map infographic here that highlights some of their different regions and the different species. But I did want to focus on the northern elephant seal, which is this one circled here in red, um, because they are actually our second most common patient. So not that I'm biased or anything, but I think that they're a wonderful marine mammal for us to highlight for marine mammals of the world. So we'll go ahead and dive in with them first. Um, like I said, our second most common patient at the center, you saw earlier in the presentation, we have quite a few, the majority of our patients on site right now are those elephant seals. And typically we're caring for the pups. That's what we've got on site. They're born in January and February. And then kind of in the early spring, we start to, to do more rescues of them. But they're born already at four feet long and weighing 75 pounds. So these are some impressive big babies right out the womb. Um, and normally what happens is while they're in this stage, either we rescue them for getting accidentally separated from mom or maybe they're malnourished. Um, and so we're taking care of those younger pups on site. But in the perfect situation, pups will nurse with their moms for a full month and they'll balloon up from 75 pounds to 300 pounds. So they look like these big, rotund sausages like we have pictured on the right here for a healthy pup that successfully nurses with mom. 
Now, I wanted to share kind of an interesting story of a elephant seal rescue that we did recently that's not as typical. I mentioned we're usually caring for pups that are malnourished or have been separated from mom or both. But in this case, we actually had a special rescue operation of an elephant seal. And it might be kind of hard to see in this picture. I'll share a better video in a moment. But we actually got a phone call uh, from someone on the a, a member of the public who was walking on the beach and saw this group of marine uh, northern elephant seals, a mom and pup, but noticed something unusual about this mom here. If you take a closer look, you can see that there's actually a visible entanglement or something caught around the neck of this mom right next to her pup. And as it turned out, turned out this mom was in fact entangled. Luckily, the, the person walking along the beach called our 24-hour hotline, reported this to us, and we were able to assemble our special rescue operations team. Now, this kind of rescue is definitely considered special rescue because as you can see, this mom is surrounded by other elephant seals and other pups. And as we learned, it's so important for mom and pup to stay together for that first month as they're nursing. So we have to proceed really carefully with this kind of disentanglement work. We don't want to scare off all the other elephant seals. And we also need to make sure mom and pup stay together. So that called for our special rescue team, which we fortunately also got a video of this very special rescue. So I'm gonna play that for you now. You'll get a chance to see it. Oh, we should play from the beginning though. So our special rescue team, you can see they have some different looking tools. They have this long pole with kind of a, a knife attached to the end. And then you'll see that they hook that knife around the entanglement and they're able to make a clean cut on just that plastic strap. So they successfully removed that entanglement and there's mom and pup healthy and happy. So always really cool to see our special rescue operations team at work and even the different tools that they're using. And also a great reminder that, you know, while we're we're celebrating World Ocean Day tomorrow. Another way that we can make sure that there's healthy oceans for marine mammals, our elephant seals, and for people is to remember to cut that loop. As it turned out, that plastic material around the neck was a plastic packing strap. So this could have been completely avoided if we remember to cut that loop on those packing straps or even things like six pack rings as well. So we can make sure to continue to do that moving forward and protect both the environment of these elephant seals and for us as well. Absolutely. And zooming in now to another marine mammal group, the cetaceans, um, also quite a diverse, large group of species. There's over 89 species of cetaceans around the world. And you can see some of our West Coast ones here. We've got humpback whales, gray whales. Um, we also see blue whales that'll travel along our coast. Um, but today we're going to focus on a cetacean species in a slightly different area of the world. Uh, we're going to talk about the narwhals that are a species of whale that live in the Arctic. And there's actually not too many whales that live in the Arctic. Um, there's only a couple species that live there full time. So belugas um, and narwhals are two of those species. And not pictured here, there's also the bowhead whales um, that spend all of their time in the Arctic. Um, and then the other ones pictured here, the orcas, humpbacks, and gray whales will come up to the Arctic to feed, but will migrate to other parts of the world, um, including some populations that we see on the West Coast. 
So today we'll talk about the narwhals, who are quite a unique species. Um, you might also know them as the unicorns of the sea. Their name, their scientific name, Motodon monoceros, means one tooth, one horn, and that's probably their most distinctive feature. Uh, but some facts about them, they're a species of toothed whales, so in the same group, main group as dolphins and toothed whales like sperm whales. Um, they are medium size compared to other whales, about 15 feet long, 3,500 pounds. Um, but yes, by far the most interesting thing about them is that a horn or actually a tooth protrudes from the male's upper lip as they get older, um, get, which gives them their nickname, Unicorn of the Sea. And before I talk a little bit more about this interesting adaptation and the narwhals, I have a little trivia for you. So we'll see if you can guess how long exactly can a narwhal's tooth get? Is it A, 10 feet long, B, one foot, C, five feet, or D, 20 feet? Let us know in the comments. You can just use the letter that you think is associated with the correct answer. All right, I'm seeing some answers coming through. Danielle says C, five feet. Peter says 20 feet, pretty long. Malamika says A, 10 feet. Let's see if there's any more guesses. Another guess for 10 feet from Pam. All right, another person's angel says D, 20 feet. Another another guess for 20 feet. All right, Laura, let's take a look at the correct answer. If you said A, 10 feet, you were correct. <laughs> it does, uh, the narwhal's tooth can go up to 10 feet long. Um, and only the males will get it. It's actually uh, one of their canines that will grow out of the root of their mouth, the right canine. Um, the left canine just grows normally and stays, with, stays within their jaw, though there are some animals out there that have been observed with two teeth protruding out. So they have two horns, um, which looks pretty cool. On the right, you can see a picture of their skull. And on the left, this is a close-up of what um, their tooth actually looks like. So narwhals are really interesting. They're actually the only species in the world to have a straight tooth that protrudes that way. There's a couple other species around the world like elephants and walruses that are known for their tusks. And just like narwhals, it's canines that protrude from their mouth, except walruses and elephants have curved teeth. Narwhals have the only straight tooth, and the reason why it's able to grow in such a straight pattern is because it grows in a spiral, and that's why it's able to be straight. Um, so really interesting and still kind of a mystery. Scientists are still trying to figure out exactly what this tooth is for. Um, it is a tooth, so it's a very sensitive organ. It might help them detect changes in the water environment or help them detect prey. Um, it's also potentially used to for, by males to impress females, you know, maybe a show of dominance. And recently, it's also been found that they use this tooth to stun prey. So I have a short little video that shows just that happening. So in the circle, you can see a narwhal um, using their tooth and they're just whacking a fish <laughs> with it to stun them and then uh, eat the fish. So really interesting adaptation. We're still learning more about the narwhal, um, this unique species, who also happens to live in a really unique habitat. So if you, we take a look at this slide, um, this map on the right shows where the narwhals live. So I mentioned they're an Arctic species and they spend most of their time around the Arctic. These are, this is where they spend time depending on the time of year. So summer, um, summer months, um, they spend areas that are colored in orange. And then in the winter, they're mostly in the areas colored in brown. Um, but they do depend on sea ice to uh, to feed. So they'll spend some of those months feeding under sea ice. 
And then during summer months, it's outside of sea ice. Um, and as we know with climate change, the Arctic is one of the fastest changing environments in the world. It's warming up up to three times faster as any other place on the planet. So even though narwhals are not currently endangered, climate change is definitely a big threat to them and the species they might depend on for food. Um, another worry with melting sea ice around the Arctic is that it opens up the Arctic to more shipping and um, oil and gas development potentially, which has been shown to disturb narwhals um, and other whales who use sound to communicate um, and also adds stress to their environment. And we mentioned um, earlier in this presentation the importance of establishing marine protected areas or parks in the ocean. Um, and this is really crucial in um, the survival of species that live in such sensitive environments. So there are moves to protect some areas of the Arctic for that exact reason, to protect narwhals um, and other similar unique species in that area. So next, I'm going to pass it over to Laura, who's going to talk about another group of marine mammals in a different part of the world. Yeah, so we're kind of moving from north to south. We just talked about the North Pole and the Arctic. Now we're moving closer to the equator and the tropical areas and some of the marine mammals that we'd find there. So it's a perfect place to highlight the Cyrenians, or you might know them as the manatees and dugongs. And I love this little infographic here that pictures the four living species of manatees and dugongs. There is one um, extinct species species called the stellar sea cow, which went extinct in the 1700s. But these four are the, the living species that are alive today. And so we moved from the, the cool waters of the Arctic to now the tropical waters, the warmer climates where you're going to find the Cyrenians. And they, as you might guess from their different names, some of the differences between these four is based on their location. So we have the Amazonian manatee, the African manatee, the West Indian manatee and the dugong. So if we look at a map of their range and their location, the manatee that comes to mind that maybe is most familiar is that West Indian manatee. That's the one found off of the coast of Florida, the Florida manatee. Um, they're also found Central America, South America, and then you might guess that the Amazonian manatee is found in the Amazon. Then we have the West African manatee highlighted in the darker green here along the West African coast. And then finally the dugong, which is found on the East African coast and then all the way down by Malaysia and Australia. So we see a difference in location for the differences between manatees and dugongs, but there are also some physical differences between them. So I've got a little picture here to help distinguish between the two. While they're both the Cyrenians, they're in that same family group, they are distinct different species. So some of the differences with the dugong, for example, you'll see that they have more of a flared outward muzzle as opposed to the rounder muzzle on the manatee. They also have more smooth skin, whereas the manatee has more rough skin. And their size is also different. So the manatees are a little bit larger. They can get up to 1,200 pounds and 10 feet long, whereas the dugongs are closer to 660 pounds and 9 feet long. So manatees are a little bit bigger there. Now, I want to focus on the manatee, the West Indian manatee, since that's one that's pretty well known and uh, fairly common. So in that group, we see about 13,000 manatees. And we also kind of know them as the sea cows, right? They're one of the really unique features about manatees is that they're strictly herbivorous. So they are vegetarian. They only eat um, a vegetation, which is very different from the other groups of marine mammals. Now, 
They're like sea cows because they eat a lot of seagrass and that can be up to 150 pounds per day. So they're eating about 15% of their body weight every day in seagrass and vegetation. So you might imagine that all of this chewing actually would grind down their teeth. Um, and because they're chewing and grinding so much, they've actually evolved to have kind of a tooth conveyor belt system where once a tooth gets worn down from all of that chewing, another tooth will grow to take its place. And this is also a really unique feature in marine mammals. When we think of a tooth conveyor belt, I automatically think of the sharks that are constantly shedding and regrowing new teeth. Now for manatees, it's not a constant shedding and regrowing. They can only regrow their teeth a certain number of times in their lifetime. But what a beneficial adaptation of this really unique marine mammal that because of their diet, they've evolved to have this kind of um, conveyor belt tooth system called rolling dentation. And interestingly, this is very similar to their closest land relative, which just so happens to be the elephant. So they have that rolling dentation. What's also interesting about the manatee is that when we think of marine other groups of marine mammals, we think of them as being rotund or larger due to that thick layer of blubber that keeps them warm. But the manatee, remember, is living in warmer tropical waters, so they're not rotund due to blubber, but rather because their digestive tract is so bulky because they have to be able to digest all of that 150 pounds of seagrass every day. So instead of blubber, it's their, their size is because of their bulky digestive tract. Um, and this, of course, means that unlike other marine mammals that have a thick insulating layer of blubber to stay warm, it means that the manatee can't really overcome the cold. So having warm tropical temperate waters is super important to those manatees. Now, manatees don't have um, any really natural predators, but you might know if you know anything about manatees that they are a vulnerable species. They have lots of threats, including things like loss of warm water habitats, which we, we learned is super important since they don't have blubber to keep them warm, um, as well as boat strikes. Now, fortunately, there are lots of efforts and protections in place to help make sure that the manatees are protected um, since they are vulnerable. So things like the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which all marine mammals are protected under, as well as the Endangered Species Act are helping to protect manatees. But really, we need to think about the best ways to responsibly manage their habitat areas, those tropical warm waters that they thrive in, uh, to help control those risks and make sure that we have manatees for future generations and preserve that biodiversity that we've been learning about today that's so important to having a resilient and healthy ocean. Now, right now in Florida, you also might have heard that there are lots of manatees that are malnourished and that are struggling to find food. And this is because they're migrating. They normally during winter will migrate into warmer waters. But because of recent cold snaps, the, the manatees are migrating into the Indian River Lagoon, where the water quality is not as good and there are declining sea grasses. So there's lots of hungry manatees out there. So again, a really important important reminder that protecting habitats is a really effective way to protect species like manatees. So also thinking about manatees, there are some fun kind of historical and mythological backgrounds around them. So I had another trivia, questions for, uh, trivia question for you here. And that is, what mythical creature was based off of the manatee? Is it A, the unicorn, B, the mermaid, C, the kraken, or D, the Loch Ness monster? So go ahead in the comments and guess what mythical creature was based off of the manatee. I'll give you a second here to type in your answers into the comments here. So we have some guesses for C, the Kraken, 
be mermaid. <laughs> B, it has to be because of that tail. One guess for Loch Ness Monster. All right. So the answer is B, <laughs> the mermaid. So Leah, you were right. <laughs> that tail definitely resembles that of a mermaid. So the early explorers thought that manatees were mermaids. Being lonely out at sea maybe can make you see some crazy things, especially if you see a unique animal like a manatee. And also way back in history, since remember manatees are found in lots of different regions in the world, um, the word dugong in Malay means lady of the sea. And there's 3,000 year old cave drawings depicting majestic dugongs found in Malaysia. So some interesting history and mythology back uh, around the manatees. All right, thank you, Laura. I noticed there was a question that came in from Alex about us, if we've ever heard of Stellar's sea cow. And I believe, Laura, that's the same extinct sea cow that you were talking about, correct? Correct, yes. So I mentioned that the four living species today we had talked about, but there is one extinct species called the Stellar Sea Cow, which went extinct in the 1700s. So thanks for that question. Good clarification. Awesome. Thank you, Alice, for asking. Um, and now after talking about the, the manatees and some Serenians, uh, we're going to once again travel to a different part of the world to come back to pinnipeds, um, and this time focusing on an Antarctic species, the Waddell seal. So there are quite a few Antarctic species of seals. Um, you might see some familiar names here. You might have heard of um, leopard seals. Um, and then you'll see that there are also some fur seals in the Antarctic. Um, not the same ones we see at the Marine Mammal Center. There's also the southern elephant seals, different from the northern elephant seals we see in California. Um, the Ross seal. And then we're going to focus on the Weddell seal. So they are one of the largest species of seal, not quite as big as the elephant seals we know and love, um, but they can grow to 10 feet long and 1,100 pounds. And they actually look um, larger to me than they might be just because of, if I don't know if you could tell from this picture, but they have tiny little heads <laughs> compared to a large body. They have lots of blubber. Um, and for them, it is indeed to stay warm in the Antarctic climate. Um, they live in one of the coldest places in the world. Um, they're actually the most southern breeding marine mammal. So they give birth on sea ice in the Antarctic. Um, they are also, um, similar to elephant seals, are incredibly deep divers. So they can go down to a thousand feet and can hold their breath for up to 90 minutes. So highly adapted to their environment. Um, they don't have a lot of land predators um, on the sea ice in the Antarctic, not a lot of threats, but they do have some ocean going predators um, such as killer whales and leopard seals. Um, and Though they don't hold any territories on land during the breathing season, they do establish underwater territories around breathing holes. Um, and that's where they spend most of their time. So during the breathing uh, and popping season, the mothers will give birth to the pups on ice where it's nice and safe um, from predators like leopard seals and killer whales. But afterwards, they'll teach pup to dive down into the water and um, the seals will then spend most of their time under the sea ice, relying on these uh, breathing holes to, um, to be able to breathe because they're still mammals like us. Um, they breathe air. And um, they are known for, uh, for using that technique. So they'll chew these sea holes. They don't rely on natural ones. They use their teeth um, to chew ramps for them to go up um, and, um, and create these breathing holes. So, and this is called reaming. Uh, but another really interesting thing about Waddell seals is they have 
uh, they communicate underwater through a variety of different sounds and their vocalizations are incredibly unique. Um, they sound kind of like spaceships or straight out of, you know, some Star Wars sound effects. So Laura, if you can play us um, some Waddell seal sounds. Yes. Thank you, Laura. So quite the interesting sound. Sounds very ethereal and alien <laughs> to me. <laughs> uh, but researchers are still trying to understand how these seals communicate underwater and how they're being impacted by other sounds in the ocean. Um, and Waddell seals are actually one of the best studied seals in the world, despite um, their very remote location, um, because they don't really have any land predators and um, they they're very docile, not really afraid of humans, making them really uh, easy to study in a lot of ways. So there's, um, they've been studied since 1968. There's a breeding population in Erebus Bay um, that we have uh, a lot of records and information on. Um, and the Marine Mammal Center has been lucky enough to partner with Polar Trek um, in Antarctica to participate in field research. And the most recent expedition, uh, we had one of our veterinarians, Emily Whitmer, go on the 2019 um, expedition to investigate physiological adaptations um, and development of young Weddell seals in the Ross Sea, particularly looking at how pups um, are able to so quickly adapt to such a cold environment and learn how to go from being on sea ice to learning how to swim and spend most of the time underwater within just a couple weeks. So lots of really interesting things to learn from the Waddell seal. Um, but also this having studied this population for so long can give us a lot of insights into how the Antarctic environment is changing. Waddell seals are a top predator and they can give us a lot of insights into how the surrounding ocean is changing. So just like our West Coast patients, they are sentinels of the sea. Um, and Waddell seals, because um, they live in such a, a sensitive environment, the Antarctic, um, and they rely on sea ice to give birth to their pups. Though they're not threatened right now, um, climate change definitely poses a big threat to this species because they are so dependent on the sea ice. So really important to continue studying this species and understand um, how they might hopefully adapt to changes brought about by climate change. Um, but this also highlights how important it is to protect these environments uh, from threats like climate change and establish um, protected areas. Um, thankfully, the Antarctic has been um, pretty well protected throughout its history. Um, in the Antarctic Th Treaty of 1959, um, a group of countries decided to um, establish the Antarctic as a peaceful territory that would be reserved for research. Uh, that could be with, um, and any insights from this research was to be shared freely to anyone um, to benefit from any of the findings around here. So in this map, you can see some of the different research stations and countries um, that have uh, research ongoing in the Antarctic. But uh, recently with uh, campaigns like the 30 by 30, there's been a lot of attention brought to the Antarctic and moves to protect more of the ocean surrounding it. So currently only 5% of the Southern Ocean that encircles the Antarctic continent is protected. Um, and a particular organization, the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, is campaigning to establish a total of 7 million square kilometers of Southern Ocean protection. So you can see some of that on this map. Uh, and some of the areas include where the Waddell seal lives. So could help, you know, further protect um, these species from other impacts like shipping um, that we were talking about in the Antarctic, in the Arctic, in addition to climate change. 
Awesome, Diane. And we I did see a question come in from Pam about how they got the name Waddell Seal. Um, so I'll share that they were named after Captain James Waddell, who first discovered them in the 1820s. So that's why they're called the Waddell Seal. And then we also had a question from Leah wondering if we get any Serenian patients at the center. So um, just to clarify, we don't see Serenian patients or Waddell seals at the center since they're kind of outside of our range. Um, we're taking care of marine mammals along 600 miles of California coastline, um, but there are lots of other groups doing some great conservation efforts for those Serenians, those manatees, dugongs, um, and as we learned, lots of research being done for that Waddell seal. So you got to hear about some of the stories of a few, just a handful of the marine mammals of the world today. Um, but if there's one thing to take away, it's that all these marine mammals and us share this one ocean. We share this climate and we together can create a more resilient and sustainable future. Especially we've talked a lot today about that 30 by 30 campaign and how wonderful it would be to protect all of those spaces on land and and in the ocean as well. And that'll have benefits for, for us and marine mammals alike. So um, in the United States, we had shared that there's an executive order that we're, we're moving forward with the 30 by 30 campaign. But if you'd like to make your voice heard for our world leaders, there is a petition that you can sign in support. Um, and you can find that on worldoceanday.org to sign up in support of 30 by 30. So feel free to, to do that if you like. And there's lots of great resources on worldoceanday.org, which again, we're celebrating World Ocean Day tomorrow. And I'll do another kind of shameless plug here that next week, same time, same place, we're having another Marine Mammal Monday, a special one for the sea lion birthday. So if you're interested and want to learn more about California sea lions like right along our California coast um, and learning more about how it's possible that over 50% are born on June 15th, you can join us next week for a very special Marine Mammal Monday live in celebration of summer with the sea lions. So with that, we'll kind of scroll through and see if there's any other questions. Otherwise, I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Diane. It's been such a pleasure. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you so much, everyone. Always a pleasure to co-lead these with you, Laura. You too. Thanks, everyone. Bye.